Dr. Bickles here, she's chief of the headache section and associate professor of pediatrics division of neurology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City and she's going to be talking about improving migraine management. Let's welcome Dr. Bickle. Thank you, thank you. Um, so first of all I just want to say that I usually like to keep things somewhat um, casual so if at some point that you have a question or a clarification that you want to ask me throughout the lecture that's perfectly fine as well. I also love that we have a diversity of um, people here at different stages of learning as well as different careers and probably unlike a lot of the other conditions that come in here I know that at least um, 15 to 20 percent of you have the condition that I'm talking about so some of you are um, can identify on many different levels with what we're talking about here today. So, um, improving migraine management. I'm, I will save you the slides, but essentially the fact is, is that migraines for years have been incredibly understudied. It's a condition that occurs most in women. It is not fatal. It doesn't show up on tests, and stress makes it worse. So it's something that has been judged fairly harshly for years. And migraines actually account for more disability than any other neurological condition, more than multiple sclerosis, more than epilepsy, more than dementias even. And that it affects people during their working lives. It comes on in their teens and their 20s. And it really costs us a lot of money as far as in lost productivity. And so what's interesting about it is that I just, as we're moving forward throughout the lecture, I just want you to stay mindful of the fact that the NIH essentially never really had headaches on its to-do list until about the last few years. So that means that no, very few drugs have ever come to market specifically to be able to treat headaches. And that's probably why a lot of us get confused in headache management, right? Do you choose a blood pressure medication, a seizure medication, an antidepressant medication? You know, and the issue is, is that what we need to do is actually invest more in the research. The other thing is that when you talk about conditions such as chronic daily headache, when headaches are occurring more than 15 days out of a month, that was used to be considered a psychiatric condition. And so it was considered, and by the way, the majority of people who have chronic daily headaches do not have problems with depression and anxiety. But because it was considered psychiatric, what that meant was that they were not enrolled in studies for years, not until the last couple years. So what that means is that we did not study people with chronic daily headache and then we end up telling our patients nothing's ever been proven to help you, <laughs> right? So we've done this kind of cycle where we've made a lot of choices through the years to not really have the evidence that we need to guide them. And I say that because it's especially true in pediatrics. We have only a few of these medications are FDA approved. And I think that one of the reasons why doctors are often hesitant to treat headaches is that there's not clear algorithms. It's not like community acquired pneumonia where there's a clear cut first line. Every headache specialist you ask, you might get a different opinion. So what I'm hoping to do is kind of consolidate that so everybody has the tools to be able to provide basic headache management. And by basic headache management, I by no means mean um, electric bathtubs. Um, I think that we've advanced a little bit since that time. So as a disclosure, I'm going to walk you through the website that we developed for patients and PCPs. Um, and that was, de um, that was developed with an independent grant from Pfizer. It is not commercialized. We get no funding from it. It is open to the public. And there are some stickers out there that I left for that as well. So some key points from the lecture to sort of take home. Um, this is where I'm a little bit controversial. I'm a headache specialist that does not recommend the routine practice of getting headache calendars. And the reason for it is not because I think that tracking your headaches is necessarily bad. But I'll talk about it a little bit more. But triggers are probably not as big of a deal as we thought that they were. And that a lot of times what ends up happening is that patients are handed a headache calendar and no treatment is actually initiated. And they're just told to come back later. And we know that most patients end up not coming back later. And so then the disability just accumulates during that time. Prevention medications, daily medications to provide the neuronal stabilization to prevent headaches should be considered when headaches are occurring more than four days a month. Um, we choose first line predominantly by the side effect profile. 
Triptans are safe. Your sumatriptans, um, such as Imitrex, are safe and they're FDA approved in ages eight and above. And I'll talk about how to use those. Stress management. So you guys will have to forgive me. I like to say a lot of analogies. Um, but I basically just say that uh, cupcakes is to diabetes what stress is to migraines, okay? That um, your diet, to manage migraines without talking about stress would be comparable to managing diabetes without talking about diet. But also you would never tell somebody with diabetes, just fix your diet, just fix your diet, that's all you need to do, right? You would do a combination of the both depending on their needs. And that's how migraine management is as well. And nar narcotics and butabatol, butabatol is, um, containing compounds such as furanel or furacet really should be avoided whenever possible in headache management. And one thing that I just want to say is I know that we don't, that not everybody in here is a pediatric provider. I'm actually an adult neurologist. Um, I always say that I kind of got into Children's Mercy through the back door many years ago. And so I treat predominantly pediatrics right now, but a lot of what I'm saying applies very much to adults as well. Um, we use similar diagnoses, similar medications, um, so there's a lot of overlap. So before I, um, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about treatment, but I wanted to do a brief review of how we make the diagnosis as well as some of the pathophysiology. So um, the first question anybody ever has, right, is why does my head hurt? Human beings have pain because pain represents damage. When your head hurts, that's real important real estate, right? So people take those headaches very seriously. But the truth is, is that we know that 95% of the time, no headache diagnosis is going to be made through um, an MRI or through laboratory work. We expect imaging to be normal, just like imaging is normal in Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is a dysfunction of the motor system in the brain. Migraine is a dysfunction, a dysfunction of the pain system. We don't really, we don't, our imaging studies can't pick those up. And so, how do we know when to get images and how do we tell our patients? One thing that I tell patients, by the way, when I'm telling them why we don't need imaging, is I let them know that the brain has no pain receptors and that, frankly, small things in the brain don't cause pain. I wish they do because then we would get brain tumors right away, right? Then we would detect aneurysms before they ruptured. But the truth is, is that um, we just really, the brain itself, um, I'll often talk to them about how you can have a stroke and essentially slump over, but it's not excruciating pain unlike a heart attack. So when do we get that imaging though? SNOOP is the acronym, and to keep it very simple, is that systemic illnesses or symptoms. So if a patient has an underlying condition, like an autoimmune condition, um, HIV or uh, cancer, these rules don't really apply they're going to be at a higher risk for secondary causes of headaches such as tumors or infections. But systemic symptoms such as fevers, weight loss, I think most of us know that if somebody comes in with a new onset headache with a fever, that migraine is you're not your number one diagnosis. But sometimes I've seen migraine mimickers in individuals where their only other sign was weight loss. So I do want to talk a little bit about the weight. Is that while a lot of my patients will say that they've lost weight because they have a decreased appetite and chronic migraines, the vast majority of them don't actually objectively lose weight. When I see drastic objective weight loss of, you know, 10 pounds a month or something along those lines, I'm certainly looking for more systemic causes. Neurological symptoms. In pediatrics, yes, the vast majority of children with brain tumors will have a headache, but less than 1% will only have a headache. The vast majority of them have five or more neurological examination abnormalities on, on their examination. So um, as I always say, and I'm a, I'm a professor at the medical school, so um, if any medical students are in the room, I always say that a medical student could find the abnormality on the medical exam, okay? That they're usually not subtle. It's things like papilledema, weakness. In sudden onset, that's when going from, um, if you ask most people with headaches about the onset of the headache, they'll say that it came on quickly. What we're talking about is from no pain to the worst pain within a minute or so. That's when you really start thinking about vascular causes such as aneurysm. The age is another cause, is that most migraines are gonna emerge in the teens and in the 20s. In pediatrics, we have a lot of great studies about six and above 
but six and below, they've not really been included in most of the imaging studies, so there's really not great guidelines for six and below. That doesn't mean that every kindergartner that gets a headache needs to be sedated for an MRI, but it always means that I have a little bit higher, of, um, little bit lower of a threshold for doing imaging in a five-year-old, for example, versus a 15-year-old, especially if the headache is occipital in a younger child. And then a new change in a headache pattern. Um, you know, migraines don't protect, uh, don't protect against brain tumors. So even if somebody has a normal, has a migraine pattern throughout their life, if they've had a change in their headache pattern, then I consider it a new onset headache. And I may consider getting imaging or secondary workup at that time. So what are the main headaches that we talk about in children? Migraines with and without aura, and that's the one I'm predominantly going to talk about today. Tension type headache, um, and that's not a typo that I put in the word type there, that's actually um, what the International Headache Society classification is, and that's because tension headaches um, were originally called tension headaches because they were associated with muscle tension and stress. But in reality, they're no more associated with stress than migraines, and 70% of people with migraines have neck pain. So, and if you talk about headaches that have not been studied, tension has been one of the least studied headaches out there. New daily persistent headache. M the vast majority of people with migraines that go into a chronic daily pattern are going to go from an episodic pattern that gradually over time turns into a daily pattern. New daily persistent headache is a really fancy term for a headache that comes on one day and it doesn't go away. These are the patients that have a tendency to be the most highly alarmed because they don't know what's going on, they don't typically have a family history of headaches, and they're very frustrated when the evaluation is normal. And these, by the way, you absolutely do an evaluation. You know, you um, do the imaging, you do the laboratory work. But in these situations, we see about 50% of the time it can be preceded by a small head trauma or by a viral infection or sometimes a, 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 mild, a minor surgery. And chronic daily headache is any type of headache that's more than 15 days a month. So migraine, how do we make the diagnosis? In pediatrics, it's two or more hours if untreated. In adults, it's four or more hours. And the untreated is a key part. Um, knowing that about half of adults who have migraines don't know that they have migraines. And that's because they can easily be treated with ibuprofen or Excedrin. And so you have to ask your patients, what is it like if you don't do anything? What would it turn into? Because um, if they're able to stop it with the ibuprofen, they might not get to the point of light and noise sensitivity and nausea. So we want to know what it's like if they were to do nothing. And then the diagnosis requires two of the following. Moderate to severe, worse with movement, throbbing, and in pediatrics, it's a bifrontal temporal distribution. So, you know, what we're often taught is more of a band-like pain or a tension-type headache. Actually, um, that, the unilateral pattern of migraine does not emerge until someone's in their 20s. So the vast majority of kids and those in their teens are going to have their migraines kind of encompass the forehead and both sides. And once again, you only need two of these. And I always like to point out moderate to severe. As healthcare providers, I think that we have somewhat of a skewed perception of what severe pain is, um, you know, because we've seen people in markedly, markedly severe pain. But when this definition was brought out, is that what they meant by moderate to severe was moderate is, I describe it as basically getting a B on a test instead of an A. You're able to show up, but you're still not concentrating that well, and you're not functioning as well as you would like to. Severe is, you certainly would lay down if you could. And, but the truth is that the vast majority of adults with migraines, for example, will work through the day and then will spend their evenings in bed, that they'll make it through the day if they can. Worse with movement. Um, this is pretty classic with migraine and it's part of the description that's often forgotten. But if it hurts to bend over, if it hurts to walk up a flight of stairs, um, if it hurts to do some walking, uh, walking or light jogging, that's one of the criteria for migraine as well. And throbbing is pretty self-explanatory. Light and noise sensitivity. What we're looking at there is not that light or noise makes somebody's headaches worse, but is that child more sensitive to light or noise when they have a headache versus other times? And sometimes parents don't notice this. Sometimes parents just think of their child as being irritable. So I really, so what we know in the pediatric population is that we can infer it from their behavior. For example, if a child typically when they have the stomach flu wants to stay in the family room and watch TV, but when they have a headache they like to go back in their room and not be bothered, 
that's we can infer from their behavior that there's the light noise sensitivity there. And by the way, I think everybody's more irritable with migraine. Nobody once has ever said, I love it when my daughter gets a migraine. She's so pleasant to be around. Um, and nausea and or vomiting. You can certainly have a migraine without the vomiting. But in pediatrics, sometimes it can show up predominantly with nausea and vomiting, especially in that five and the six-year-olds. I once had a family um, that swore their child was allergic to birthday cake because every time that their five or six-year-old went to a birthday party, they would end up vomiting and, and headaches and would feel miserable. And then one time it happened on Christmas, and so they decided it couldn't be birthday cake. Um, but this was a child whose symptoms were so predominantly um, stomach that the child never even mentioned that they had a headache during that time as well. And that, that also means for medication choices, that if they've got, so all migraineurs have an element of gastroparesis and will have difficulty absorbing medications PO, but especially if that emesis is strong, that we might need to think about alternatives such as Imitrex nasal spray or Zomig nasal spray. So the pathophysiology of migraines. It is not little demons attacking somebody's head. That's a spoiler alert. So the neurovascular theory, I think that a lot of us were actually taught um, more of a vascular theory of migraine, that, um, that migraine was comparable in a lot of ways to vasoconstrictions, and they, it was called Wolf's th um, vascular theory. And in reality, what we know now is that it's, it's what we refer to more of a neurovascular theory, and the, the way to think about it is that the dysfunction lies predominantly within the neurons and not within the blood vessels. And so that's why it actually shares a lot more in common with epilepsy than it does, for example, with strokes. Migraine with aura does have an increased risk of stroke, um, especially in middle-aged women, but we still see it, um, the pattern of it having more in common with this kind of a paroxysmal condition that um, is due to neuronal instability. So how does it work? It starts with cortical spreading depression, then you get your blood vessel changes, and then you get what's kind of referred to as this sort of um, an inflammatory soup of uh, different sort of neuropeptides and chemicals that then um, start the activation of the pain system. We then end up with activation of the trigeminal nucleus to the point where the trigeminal nucleus within the brainstem will start actually processing allodynia and so it'll make non-painful stimulation hurt, such as brushing the hair, wearing contacts, touching the forehead. So what is cortical spreading depression? It's a wave of short-lasting neuronal excitation followed by prolonged depression of the cortical neuronal activity. It was actually, um, it was first discovered in, in rabbits, actually. And um, there was also another gentleman who, what he did with his own, he was a neuroscientist, Lashley, and what he did is he actually mapped out his own aura as it was forming, his own visual sort of um, formations, and that he figured out that it had to be spreading across the cortex at two to three millimeters per second. And um, that is definitely a smart man. So while everybody else was talking about it being a vascular, he's got drawings from the 40s and 50s where he's mapping it out going across the cipital cortex. And he was right. Because um, in the 1990s, what they found is that when um, we started doing more functional imaging in individuals with migraines, is that it does not follow a vascular pattern, meaning the changes that we see across the cortex are not due to vasoconstriction or vasodilatation, but it's due to the neuronal changes originally. And what's interesting is that the occipital cortex is the part of the brain that is most susceptible to cortical spreading depression, and so that's why visual auras are the most common neurological symptom that we see in about 10 to 15 percent of our patients. But if it happens in your motor strip, that's where they get the hemiplegia, right? And that's where it looks like a stroke. But hemiplegic migraine is a channelopathy. It's not actually vascular. So cortical spreading depression. So we know the brain doesn't have pain. So that's why the aura doesn't hurt, because that's when it's going across the cortex, all right? So then how does that actually lead to pain? What you end up then is you end up actually with activation of the trigeminal sensory fibers, um, which is where the pain cascades begin. And you start to get a release of CGRP, substance P, and inflammatory cytokines. 
the takeaway from this is predominantly about the fact that there's a lot of different things that are going on in a migraine. And I think that any of us who have treated headaches are well aware that some people really respond great to this and some people really respond great to that. And I think because we're talking about a very heterogeneous condition that sometimes needs polypharmacy or sometimes it needs alternative treatments. The other thing too is that CGRP is the newest target for migraine management. Over the next year, they're close to being FDA approved, and over the next year, we're going to start seeing basically um, CGRP uh, <clears throat> antibodies that'll be able to be performed um, either through infusions or IM injections that are working for headache prevention. And so it'll be a whole new way to treat headaches over the next coming years. So, um, and by the way, as far as the pediatric, they're, they are already starting to expand to pediatric trials. Activation of the nociceptors. So we start, I just want to point this out right here, the trigeminal nucleus caudalis, which most people haven't thought of since medical school when they had to memorize it for a test, right? Um, but if you see here, you can see V1, V2, and V3. And the reason that I point this out is because it is not uncommon. We typically think of migraines as sort of causing pain around this area. But the vast majority, I mean, sorry, but a significant amount of people with migraines will actually end up with activation of the parasympathetics that uh, go along with V1 and V2. And when we see that activation, what we're actually seeing is we can see um, symptoms such as nasal congestion, teary eyes. Um, how many people have had the pleasure of being hit in the face with a baseball, right? You know, like how the, suddenly you become incredibly autonomic. That's what happens in these patients, in a fair amount of patients, because of the trigeminal activation. And that's why so many of them can get diagnosed with sinus conditions, or so many people self-diagnose themselves with sinus headaches. Um, so anybody who says that sinus headaches run in their family, it's going to be migraines, right? Um, they don't have some sort of genetic predispos um, predisposition to sinusitis, um, typically. <clears throat> So migraine treatment, another spoiler alert, does not involve trepanation. Um, they originally thought, of course, um, that, that uh, migraines were caused by demons in the head that you had to let out. And there, um, some of my patients have seemed that way. But um, for the most part, that is not the case. <sighs> I know what I do for a living. So why do we care about headaches? I already talked about how it's not fatal, right? It doesn't show up on test. And it's because of the disability. That is our ultimate goal, is to decrease the disability. And so that's why all of our patients that have significant disability that we see in clinic, they don't get just medication management. We really try to do a comprehensive approach to improve functioning and get them back to school and get them back to their lives. Because if we can at least minimize the disability that they have, we can minimize the impact that it has on their lives. <clears throat> so, I want to talk a little bit about the disability of pediatric migraine. What we see here is a quality of life score. The higher the score, the better the quality of life. Lower the worse, right? So we've got physical health, psychosocial, emotional, social, and school. Um, you can see here that individuals with headaches really have similar quality of life issues to um, some individuals that have other conditions. But the biggest thing that I want to point out is that these are teenagers. Social functioning is better than school functioning <laughs> in all of them, right? And But the difference is, the reason why I point this out is we all know that, right? Um, I have four boys and two of them are teenagers right now. And I guarantee you that it is much easier to get them to go out with their friends than it is to get them to do homework, right? But the difference is, is that if an individual with migraine goes to prom and has a great time on the weekends, but on, during the week isn't functioning, then their condition overall suddenly gets doubted, right? Everybody suddenly doubts their pain, they doubt the validity. And so sometimes what we end up doing is actually telling those kids, we want you to look more disabled so that we believe you. <laughs> um, not that I'm saying that I don't want them to go to school, but what I tell them is that, you know, it doesn't mean that they don't have the condition just because we see them having fun. And if you look at it, it's very different than adult. So adults with chronic migraine, you can see over here, that 8% of them will have missed five days of school, I'm sorry, five days of work or school over the past three months. But the vast majority of their disability is coming in the house and out of the things that they love. 
And so it's really, so a lot of times people think that maybe adults with chronic migraine are just looking for disability or this or that, and that is absolutely not the case, right? We see the vast majority of them trying their hardest to function and maintain um, their work. Also, sometimes, you know, the headache patients can be judged, you know, like that maybe they don't, they just don't want to go to school or maybe they just don't want to work. This is the migraine disability score. The, in this situation, the higher the score, the more the disability. And what we see is that in patients that have gone from chronic daily headache to an episodic headache pattern, how much their quality of life and their functioning can improve. So a very treatable condition. And this in a condition that was considered untreatable. Right? So how do we assess disability? Because this is going to be one of the most important things. And actually studies indicate that providers are much more likely to prescribe, head, um, to treat headaches and take them more seriously if they know how it affects an individual's life. So I ask them straight out, how do headaches affect your life? And don't worry, most of the teenagers stare at me blankly. <laughs> so I give them ways to be able to help answer with that. But sometimes they're able to give me really pretty articulate answers. I ask about how many full days of school they've missed over this past year, and especially over the last 30 days. What we see is that um, <clears throat> my PhD partner and I have a multidisciplinary clinic where we see the kids. Um, he sees them, we see them with psychologists, with social work, and we really work with school reentry. And when we originally set up the program, we had this elaborate scoring system to try to figure out who would need just traditional neurology treatment and who would need the comprehensive services. And what we basically found is that the elaborate scoring system didn't really work, but what worked was asking them a simple question of, um, are you missing four or more full days of school a month? And those kids that were missing four or more full days of school a month were in the process of a downward spiral where they would start to become deconditioned, grades would start to get behind. And remember, this is a condition made worse by stress. So everything continues to get worse and worse. They also, it starts to become their identity. They're that sick kid that's never here. Their sleep gets screwed up because that day that they've missed school, they stay in bed all day, so then they can't sleep that night. So that's really when we start to see that medication alone has a very hard time pulling those kids back. That's when I often feel like we really need to get that team involved with the social worker that works with the school and that we also get um, the psychologist to be able to help to identify any other psychosocial concerns that might be contributing to this. Um, I asked them about missed classes and, um, or visiting the school nurse. In the Olathe School District, um, in the middle schools and high school combined, they have 5,000 visits a year to the school nurse for headaches. 20% um, of the kids that are on medical homebound are on homebound for headaches. Um, it's this, this, this thing that's out there that's really not completely addressed. Um, and I already mentioned that. So headache calendars, why am I not a huge believer in headache calendars? And one of the reasons is because sometimes it postpones treatments. Um, now, someone who says we're going to, so the way that I look at it is basically I compare it to asthma. Asthma is an episodic, I mean, is a chronic condition that has episodic flares, right? And the vast majority of time when you're seeing someone in clinic, you're not able to come up with any objective evidence just by seeing them. But by a good history, you can typically figure out if you need to be able to start them on a controller or if you need a controller and a rescue inhaler, right? It's the same thing with headaches, is that you don't need to know if it's exactly four days a week or five days a week. That's enough for you to be able to guide the general treatment. And so there's, we usually are able to gather enough information to be able to start treatment right up front. The other thing that I don't like about it in the pediatric world is how easily we can influence kids' identities. And just the idea of a parent and a child sitting down every day to talk about their headaches can really make them kind of take on that persona quite a bit more. And I, even if you just think about the language of, um, I was a six today. I'm a four right now. <laughs> you know, how easily that becomes who they are and how easily that becomes how they can judge what they do that day. When really we try to promote that we address it, we know that it's there, but we don't focus on it. Triggers, we had a perspective, um, one of the few perspective um, trials in, in diet and headache. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that some people don't respond to diet therapies, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that the vast majority of time, you're not going to find that if you just eliminate hot dogs that you're headache free. 
and you're typically not going to be able to find that. And what we what we find as far as headache triggers are concerned is that the vast majority of them are still going to be associated with stress. Um, and it's interesting that in adults, it's a lot of the letdown stress. So they might be able to function during high periods of stress, but as soon as that's gone, then they have a disabling migraine. Um, menstrual cycles, 70% of women will get um, a migraine around the time of their period. 70% of women that have migraines are more likely to get it around the time of their period. And then weather pressure changes, the barometric pressure changes are another clear trigger. So those are the ones that we really know. The other thing too is that I, um, I don't necessarily want people doing big elimination diets because I know for sure stress makes headaches worse, right? And a parent and a child fighting over food every day is certainly stressful. And so it's a different a dynamic than just a, a, an adult deciding to do it on their own. Now, <clears throat> I, I don't think I'm probably the only one that has ever had um, divorced parents that come in and one of them say, well, she never has headaches at my house. And the other one says, she has a headache every day. <laughs> and I'm like, there's no possible way that I know how to treat that. So, and there are some situations in which there is no way to get a good enough history to know what to move forward with next. And I will absolutely do headache calendars in that situation. Or I'll do headache calendars if they continue to come back um, and, and we're really having a hard time communicating and trying to figure out if we're moving in the right direction or not. So. These are the four, you know, I don't, I'm, when I think about me managing headaches, I really don't think of it just from a medications perspective. I think of it from the fact that we need the abortive therapy on hand, the prevention if it's indicated, lifestyle recommendations, as well as school accommodations if necessary. And so when do we think of abortive therapy? This is if over-the-counter medications are ineffective. The truth is, is that over-the-counter medications can be pretty effective in headaches and that sometimes parents haven't even tried them. Avoid narcotics and butabatol. Treat as soon as possible. Now here's the thing, though, is that if somebody's having more than 10 days of headache a month, your abortives are very unlikely to work. As a matter of fact, that most of the triptan studies excluded anybody that had more than eight days of headache a month. And that's because the more frequent that you have headaches, the less responsive you are to abortives. So as soon as someone is starting to get into the 10 to um, 15 days of headaches a month, that's when I really start telling them that I'm not sure how well this is gonna work, but we're gonna focus on prevention. The other reason why I really push that is because we know those abortives aren't going to work. So when they try it the next day, they're gonna call your office, right? And they're going to want a new one. And then all the while you've got the prevention that you're waiting to be able to take effect and they're calling you 10 to 15 times for new abortives. When I try to set the standard right up front that it's not tomorrow's headache I care about. I'm willing to work on it, but what I care about is that the next three months are better than the last three months. So, Medication overuse headaches is the term for what we used to call rebound headaches, which I think most people are familiar with, that the, if you use abortives a lot, you can actually create more headaches. Um, the way that I think about it is that the migraine brain feels like it is supposed to have a migraine. And so when you just keep trying to block it, it just ups the ante, right? And so one of the ways that does it, for example, is with narcotics, it'll actually, exposure to narcotics actually cause an up production of CGRP. And I've already mentioned how CGRP is um, one of the key molecules that we know in migraines. And the reason that we've gotten rid of the term rebound is because it's not about withdrawal. It's about exposure. It's not about coming off of it. It's just about the exposure to it. And so I used to have a lot of questions on, well, what if we just put them on long acting? Then that way they'll never withdraw from it and that might be able to help manage them. And, um, <clears throat> and the answer is no. And, and what we know is that it's not just if you're treating them for headaches. A lot of the studies have come from people that were treated, let's say, for cancer or for back pain or got narcotics for other reasons. I've had countless um, patients that were in a refractory pattern. After going through cancer treatments and during that time they used the much needed narcotics, cancer goes into remission and now they have these disabling headaches and can't get off the narcotics. And so sometimes we have to take them through a program to be able to help address that. One of the reasons why butabatol is so bad is that it's really just five days a month. That's really just about one or two times a week and it will double the risk of transforming into chronic migraine. And so that's why I avoid it at all costs. 
The other thing too is that um, Fioranel Fioraset is essentially like um, combining a, a barbiturate with Excedrin. And that in my patients that I'm really trying to work with them to address their stressors and to incorporate self-management skills. I don't necessarily want them being able to get that suppressant um, like that. And that's sometimes why it's so effective for people. Opiates eight days a month, especially in men. Triptans about 10 days a month and NSAIDs about 14 days a month. So how do I interpret this literature? Basically that I don't flip out if somebody comes to me using a lot of NSAIDs. I tell them about it, I talk to them about it, I say we're going to have to address it, but typically in those situations if you can just get them on a prevention, you can get the headaches under good control. But if somebody comes in that's using a lot of butabatol and opiates, I let them know right away that um, this is an uphill battle as long as that they're, they're on board. So. Um, Typically, first-line options are going to be prescription dose like ibuprofen or naproxen. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have zolmatriptan on here, which is now approved as well. But sumatriptan, um, nasal spray PO, almatriptan, which is Axert, and rizotriptan in the PO in the mouth. So how do you choose between the triptans? Insurance coverage. Honestly, that's it. Okay? That none of them have been shown in a head-to-head -head trial to be more superior. Sumatriptan is more likely to produce the triptan side effect, which is about 1 in 20 people. I describe it as a weird feeling between here and here of chest pressure. Maybe their head feels tight. They feel very worried. And that's actually why I don't allow the school nurse to be the first person to administer it. I want the parent to be the first person to administer it, or else they end up in the emergency room, right? Because they think that something has happened. Um, but if I educate the parent on it. So if somebody's had a triptan effect on a sumatriptan, you can sometimes go to almatriptan or rizotriptan and they can be able to tolerate it. Sumatriptan nasal spray, those kids with the strong GI symptoms, that is key, right? That is one of the ways that you can be able to get the abortive in them quick. But the thing is, is that a lot of times kids like to put it in and then swallow it. It's absorbed in the nasal mucosa. So you spray it in, you close the nostril, and let it get absorbed. And it tastes really bad. And um, kids, kids, strangely enough, don't like things that taste bad, um, especially when they have a migraine. So sometimes what we'll do is um, I'll encourage the parent to actually give them a butterscotch or give them like a peppermint while they're taking it. Um, and so they can suck on that while the medication's going in. Um, one note as far as the melt tablet is that I don't recommend that when you're trying to by bypass the GI system. That's really just if you're trying to bypass a kid who can't swallow, right? It does not, it's still absorbed in the stomach, you know, so it's not sublingual. And so it actually can, the melt takes actually a little bit longer to get into the stomach than the, the, the PO formulation does. So that's not something that you would use for a quicker onset, but you could use it as an alternative for a kid who can't swallow pills. Um, but the other thing too is, I don't know how many people have seen them, they crumble very easily. And that in this situation, especially in like an adult who has a migraine themselves trying to open it, it can be very frustrating and they can actually end up losing a lot of the medication um, because it can fall on the ground while they're trying to open the package. So triptans, I typically think of this as eight and above. Um, avoid it with cardiovascular disease, liver damage, and it is contraindicated in migraine with motor weakness, hemiplegic migraine. But that's because that's when the studies were originally thought that it was vascular. The truth is that a lot of headache specialists use it in individuals with hemiplegic migraine, but it's not something that I would routinely recommend. I've already talked about the triptan effect. The big thing about it is that it's safe, and so I let them know that it's safe and it's going to get better within 30 minutes, but nobody ever wants to feel it again. I give it the earliest onset and you can repeat once after two hours. Triptans are essentially ineffective on the second day or even hours into it. So they have to have easy access for it to work. Um, you know, like I, I basically tell my patients a lot is the truth is that we're not very good at stopping headaches once they start. Um, even in the emergency room, we um, really struggle to be able to find effective headache treatments. I think of these as abortive amplifiers. How can we take an NSAID or a triptan and make them better? First of all, NSAIDs and triptans together have a synergistic effect. And so that's, um, you know, there are some products on the market that actually have them combined, or you can actually have the patients take them combined. But also, a lot of times I'll add an antiemetic, or if it's at night, a, a diphenhydramine, or during the day, a caffeine. 
though I always have to watch myself to tell um, teenagers that they can take caffeine to stop their headaches because um, I've certainly had people come back to me and they've started drinking like five Dr. Peppers a day and say well Dr. Bickle told me to do that like this was this was not my advice um, and so sometimes in those situations like I especially like in younger kids honestly is for the school nurse to have an NSAID and a can of coke or something along those lines that they just keep there for those purposes so prevention therapy, I already mentioned that at about four days or more a month. Lifestyle, um, and the reason for that is because we start to see an increase of headaches once they've started having four or more headaches a month. It takes eight to 12 weeks to see a benefit. I let them know the vast majority of people are not gonna be headache free. A reasonable goal is um, one headache a week or less that does not interfere with your quality of life. I start with low doses. For example, if you start at too high of a dose of amitriptyline, you've lost them forever, right? So I start at incredibly low doses. I let them know that I'm not just covering up symptoms, right? That I'm actually helping to provide neuronal stabilization. These are not narcotics, which is typically covering up the symptoms. I'm actually working at the nerve cells, um, though it's not a cure. Um, it's always important to be mindful of the fact that 20% of individuals with chronic daily headache have um, major depression and 20% of them are um, currently thinking about killing themselves. And so in some of our medications carry with them suicide risk, so we always have to be mindful of that, and so we ask all of our patients about suicidality. Um, I'm getting low on time, so I'm going to continue to go through this, but that there's so many different options. So how do you decide? I think that the vast majority of first-line management can be amitriptyline, topamax, or magnesium. We actually use magnesium quite a bit because it has such a limited side effect profile and patients are very responsive to it and then I don't have to worry about the suicidality and the different side effects that occur with it. We use actually a lot of the nutraceuticals that I've got um, listed there as well. So these are the dosings through it. Um, that I typically start about 20% of the target dose. Some key questions here is that people often ask, should you get an EKG? We typically don't get an EKG until we're at about one milligram per kilogram a day. Um, prior to that time, we typically just go ahead and dose the amitriptyline. Topiramate. Um, this is a medication that I always say is loved or hated, right? That it can have an amazing benefit or a patient can look at me and be like, I cannot believe you put people on that. Um, it can cause difficulty with thinking. It can cause tingling in the hands and feet. And one of the strange things that it can cause is um, carbonated beverages can taste funny. I once had a patient that kept driving through the McDonald's drive through telling them that their soda fountain was broken um, because the, the, the Topamax had altered her taste. Um, we don't use them the risk of suicide, um, especially in thin-built teenage girls with body image. We know that if we put them on Topamax, we can actually increase the risk of them developing an eating disorder. So because they like that appetite suppression. And there's an increased risk of kidney stones. Magnesium, I write a prescription for magnesium gluconate. Why do I do that? It's because when I used to tell them to get magnesium over the counter, I don't know what they would come back with. And so many of them would forget about it. I also think that there's a good placebo effect from actually you know, giving them a prescription, sending it to the pharmacy, and filling it from the pharmacy. And then that way I actually know what they're getting. So lifestyle recommendations, we talk about this with everybody. And um, stress management, whether it be cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy probably has the most evidence in any headache treatment. Biofeedback, mindfulness, self-regulation training, and then we do a lot of school disability letters. What I mean by that is that we encourage the children to go to school every day no matter what, but if they have to spend that day in a study hall, that's okay. But what we try to do is get them there every day so that they don't end up in that disabling headache pattern. But once we get them there, we um, encourage the schools and work with the schools to be able to provide accommodations. We don't ever put children on complete homebound. And that's because what we typically see then is that they really start to get become discondi deconditioned. They start to have increased somatization and increased disability. I used to think if I could put a child on homebound for just a month or so while the medications kicked in, I'd be able to bring them back to life. And that's never been successful. So I wanted to show you what we developed, the website that we developed that goes over all of this. Because once again, I know that I'm getting um, late on time here. But what we developed was a website that patients can have access to at headachereleaf.com. 
and we created a video, for example, that's available in Spanish, but these are the most common questions that patients will come in with. So we'll often actually have patients watch them before their provider goes in the room with them. Because in that way, that when you're trying to explain to them that they don't need an MRI, they've already heard it. When you're trying to explain to them that you're not gonna treat them with narcotics, they've already heard it. You know, so they have a little bit more of an understanding, and in that way they know that it's not just the provider's opinion, but that it actually is based in fact. And we kind of go through all of those issues. The other thing that we do is that, and this by the way is with a grant, that we, we have this in the school systems, like so far right now in the Olathe school system, where um, the school nurses basically are using those visits to educate the patients, because what we're trying to do is get them to actually set up an appointment to talk to their PCP about headaches. So many of them try to combine it with a well child visit or combine it with an asthma visit or just kind of combine it as the doctor's walking out the door. And so what we've tried to do is get them to pro be more proactive. And so there's, for example, we have a, Q and, um, a true and false quiz on there for them. We also have a section for lifestyle management um, including all the different, it has little quizzes to figure out how protected their brain is, as well as some snarky responses and if they think that they don't need to relax. Um, but we set up videos and everything as well, progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery, breathing exercises. And then up in here, kind of hidden, we have an area for the medical providers. This does not save any of your information. Um, and so everything can be printed off. But basically what you can do is that it walks you through an algorithm sort of about what I talked about today. Um, and it'll walk you through essentially yes or no questions on if you need to do prevention. It'll help you to rec recommend dosings. It goes through prevention, abortives, um, nausea medications, as well as one of the things too is that it'll actually create a school letter for you. So all you have to do is basically check on the boxes and the reason for putting your name in it is so that it can actually create a school letter for you to be able to provide so that um, the it can save hopefully a lot of time. It involves hand, um, handouts for health habits as well and um, a customized headache diary if you decide that you want to make a headache calendar, you can pick what you want them to be able to record so that the next time that they come back to you, they'll have that. And then what it does is it walks through a summary in a packet that then can be printed off for the patients. Um, so really trying to, because um, headaches can be very, can take a lot of time to treat, so really trying to make that a little bit more streamlined. Um, Okay, I'm gonna move through this stuff really quick, but basically I also wanna let you guys know that starting in July of 2018, we're gonna be starting to offer a headache fellowship. It's the, through the United Council of Neurology. And this is a one year fellowship that someone can receive additional headache training. And this is open not just to neurologists, but it's open to pediatricians. This is open to really almost any other spe specialty. Um, we're looking into opening over the next year an acute headache treatment center as an alternative to the urgent care or the emergency room that would be run by a headache provider from eight to five and basically a walk-in clinic or a referral clinic where they could get the IV treatments and the injections and whatnot that they need to help abort their headaches. Um, Anybody out there run 5Ks? And on September 30th, we are doing Running for Research. We're one of three sites that helps to raise money for headache research. And that some of the money is actually given back to us. We have started a scholarship for medical students at UMKC. I'm also the course director for their medical neuroscience class. And we um, have started a, uh, in order to help medical students get involved in headache research during their medical school curriculum. All right, and so I think that I've left a few minutes for questions. Thank you all. Any questions? Yeah. For uh, uh, our ER folks that are here, you get a child in the ER with a full-blown migraine, just an incredible pain. What would be your first recommendation for uh, therapy for that child? 
IV fluids and compazine is, is typically what we're going to see the most effective. One of the biggest problems that we've had with compazine is that it's on and off available to give or not. I typically recommend as an alternative than Reglan. Um, there is some controversy if you routinely give it with Benadryl or without Benadryl. Sometimes people think that Benadryl could help to prevent some of the dystonic reactions that you might get with the compazine. But then again, you also bring up increased risk of sedation, sometimes urinary retention issues, so it's a mixed bag there. Um, that is really what we see being the most effective. Um, and most of the time what we see is that, um, so those are really kind of more of our first line treatments. Then after that, the evidence becomes less and less what it is. Do we move at that point towards Tordal? Do we move at that point towards Depakon? We actually see pretty good similar evidence for both of them. So we usually recommend second line more of a Tordal medication just because of its side effect profile is more promising than, than Depakon. Um, but it can be hard because the truth is, is that from adult studies, of those who have emergency room visits for migraines, only 24% of them are headache free the next day. So even if you can make them feel better that day, it's really like just putting like a band-aid you know, on it that, that we're not, it's really just the vast majority of them probably really need, do need the prevention and need um, some abortives at home. Any other questions? Yep. In regards to lifestyle management, how often do you feel like you see kids with the intersection that spend an excessive amount of screen time? Does that seem right. to play a lot? You know, and I think that's great. Uh, that's a great question. So there's not been direct studies looking at screen time specifically with um, pediatric migraine, but we absolutely have seen studies that the, the um, what's referred to as couch potatoes, right? That that kids that um, are overweight and sedentary lifestyles have a much higher risk of headaches than individuals that are more active. Um, screen time is always, again, one of those hard things, right? Because um, uh, and especially one of the things that I think about screen time is not just the visual um, aspect of it, but um, if anybody's ever seen some people play video games, they're like, oh gosh, no, this, that, you know, and they have these emotional ups and downs, and that sometimes I think that that's probably not exactly good for headaches either. When you have a patient in the ER that is adamant that their headaches are only treated by narcotics, mm -hmm. how do you approach that conversation with that, like trying to help them without getting very defensive and... So, I mean, I think that's hard, you know, and I think that it's, it's one of those situations that, um, that what I always make them know is that I absolutely believe them. So I think that's one of the things too, is that, that sometimes people can say you can't get nar narcotics, but they give off a dismissive tone. And that essentially what I really try to reinforce is the fact that I actually talk to them, I use the word CGRP, and I actually will give them the science behind it, and, and that's why. And I'm like, I'm not concerned about your addiction. You know, like I, I'm not concerned about that. I will let them know, but I'm like, it's because of the fact that I tell them I'm a headache specialist. If, head if narcotics were the best way to treat your headaches, why wouldn't I do that? You know, just like I tell the kids with school, if putting you in a dark, quiet room for two months was the best way to treat your headaches, why wouldn't I do that? I don't care what your principal thinks. It's because this is the best way to treat your headaches. And so that's really what I try to do, is I really try to align more of a partnership with them and try to make it not about a fight between us, but a fight against it. Um, and then I also try to use as many resources as possible. So one of the resources that we'll use sometimes when, um, when we have a family that thinks that we're somehow being cruel, that we won't do narcotics, and, um, is that you can look at, um, you know, there was that campaign, I think, that the American Medical Association did of the top five things that they wanted from every field, like the Choose Wisely com campaign, that each field was responsible for choosing five things that they thought every specialists should know in every field. And neurology chose as one of their top five to avoid using narcotics and migraines. And so I will often actually hand them that sheet and will show them just how serious it is that they chose out of all the neurological conditions, out of all treatments, not to do that because it was so against evidence. Um, and, but I think the other thing too is that at ER doc that it's um, also probably really important to have a good alignment with someone who can manage headaches then, right? Because I think that's the other thing too, is that you don't want to make them feel abandoned. Yeah. Um, what are your typical <coughs> uh, patients that would, uh, you would see as a referral from pediatricians? So, um, what are the typical patients that I would see from pediatricians or when do I recommend referral or? Uh, 
Um, oh, yeah. Okay, so you know it's all over the board, honestly. There, I feel like there are some um, pediatricians who, who don't want to manage headaches at all, so they will get um, some, some of the patients that we get. As a matter of fact, um, through uh, uh, retrospective chart reviews, in 2014, 70% of the patients that were referred on our med on to our clinic had never been tried on any medication. Um, and so most of them are fairly treatment naive. Um, but then there are other PCPs that are um, in, in incredibly well equipped, very good at treating headaches, and so they typically will refer once that disability is a problem or once the patterns have really become refractory. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was wondering if um, you've tried the NSAIDs, the triptans, and then would you um, uh, have us refer them for uh, behavioral therapy also for this? Yeah. yeah, you know, and so the the, the the way that I look at it is that um, I don't actually even think that uh, refractoriness to treatment is the indication for recommending cognitive behavioral therapy. I kind of introduce it at everybody's visit right up front. And I just talk to them about the pain pathways and how important it is. Because one of the things that I've noticed that if I use it just dependent upon if they respond to treatment or not, is that then they start somehow thinking that I don't think their headaches are real and now they need something else. Whereas what I try to do is kind of incorporate it right up front. And it's a hard sell, absolutely, to be able to get, um, to, to get some people into the counseling. But, um, but I, I think that most people get it. And even if I can't get them into counseling, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy, I try to get them to start doing relaxation exercises on a daily basis, that if they can do something along the lines of biofeedback or mindfulness or meditation every day, I'll sometimes even write it out like a prescription. And so sometimes that's how I'm able to give them somewhat of an um, introduction to, to it. Thank you. Sure. You spoke about magnesium glutamate for uh, preventive therapy. Is there any role in the ER for abortive therapy? You know, that's always a great question, right? And I feel like that's something that the evidence does lean us towards, that IV magnesium can be effective for headaches. Um, there's some evidence that it's more effective in migraine with aura than without. Um, but it's interesting, though, because there's something about IV magnesium that kind of um, incites different feelings. Like there are some docs that swear by it and thinks that it should be a first line, and there are other docs who think that it has no use. But if you look at the evidence, it is something that I would put somewhere between second and fourth line, depending on who's in front of you. So I will absolutely use it. Like for example, um, one of the things that I didn't really talk about is that if we have a kid that it's in a really refractory headache pattern, we'll bring them into the neurology clinic for five days in a row where they get dihydroergotamine, and I'll typically give them um, IV magnesium every day as well. Yeah, I would say, you know, um, and that's the thing is that if you're looking at your, your adolescent that's like 60 kilos or above, or adults, um, typically 500 of mag sulfate is the, the going dose, probably no more than twice a day. Um, and so there's some thoughts about how quickly you can infuse it, and you know, but the truth is, is that I think that it is an easy one to add on. One of the problems sometimes is just the burning that can occur with it. Um, but I, you know, like so many things with headaches that, you know, like um, there's so many things that I think are like placebo, right? You know, but then you see these super responders to it, like people who have not responded to anything else. And that's the way mag IV magnesium is, in my opinion, that there are just some people that are incredibly responsive to it. On the non pharmaceutical, uh, we talked about the magnesium, yeah. and some of these other ones, I mean, the dosages are not included in. You know, it's hard to know on some of these non-prescription things yep. what doses to use. Yep. And are there any interactions between them? Can you say, well, you try this and then add this? I mean, where would we get a resource that would tell us? So one of the good things is the American Academy of Neurology actually has really great guidelines that includes all of the dosing. It goes through all of the preventions, including um, your typical nutraceuticals, and it goes through, it's from the adult data, but it goes through these different agents as well as what was studied. You know, for example, um, one of the problems, and I completely agree with you, that's one of the issues, is that you don't see as much of the standardization with it, and so it's hard to know exactly what you're um, doing. One of the ones that I'll use pretty routinely as well is riboflavin, 400 milligrams a day. Um, Butterbur, 
is the brand name of that is Petadolex, and that actually has level A recommendations from the American Academy of Neurology based on its um, randomized controlled trials. And so in that situation, I recommend the company that actually did the studies, which is Petadolex, and that's 75 BID. Um, Feverfew, I actually don't recommend because of the fact, um, on a regular basis, if because of the fact that the study that was, the compound that was studied is not available commercially, it's called MIG-99, and they have, and so there's so many other other fever fuse out there and I think that's where it becomes a little bit harder um, to be able to look at. Um, coenzyme Q10 has typically been a dose of about 100 milligrams BID. Um, in some studies it's been shown to be pretty effective, other studies not as much. Melatonin actually is starting to really, I didn't think it had much behind it, but UCF, UCSF and whatnot is really starting to show some good studies between three to five milligrams at night. But once again, it's so hard because we don't have standardization of those products and I really wish we did. Um, Acupuncture, I'm an acupuncturist now. I went through the training about 2015 and it's something that I did because the Cochrane reviews started showing it come ahead, basically that it was pretty effective, low side effect profile. And it's interesting because when I signed up for it, I, I thought it would be me and a bunch of hippies and just, you know, <laughs> teach me where to put those needles and I'll have a bit good bedside manner and I'll get a response. And I have to admit that a few months into it, I was like, wow, there is there is something here. And so that's another one of those things where while all of this certainly has a placebo effect, pain has a major placebo effect. The truth is I see some people like with, who've responded to acupuncture that have not responded to anything else. And Cephaly is a TENS unit basically for the head, forehead. It looks like a princess crown that's FDA approved and has been shown in studies to be effective for daily use. And is, um, Some kids love it and other people find it excruciating to wear it. Um, Any of your hippies suggest medical marijuana? You know, <laughs> medical marijuana, gosh, that's always the hardest question to be able to answer, right? And, um, and it's one, that I've got to be honest, that I've never spent a lot of time researching the literature of it just because we haven't really had the, it's not here. Um, and I, and I think that my concerns with medical marijuana are gonna be the same as my concerns with something like butabatol or anything like that, that I want people addressing the stressors in their life. I'd much rather them doing the biofeedback and engaging with it and not necessarily suppressing it. Um, and so I, I don't know, you know, and that's one of my things is that um, I, I have not seen any evidence that I thought was mind-blowingly optimistic and I'm not sure how I feel about when I am going to have to start making those decisions more. Especially in your neighbor's kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes. Um, our neurology professor talked a lot about um, Botox. Mm -hmm. Use migraine. Is that something that didn't see it up there at all? Yeah, it should be. Um, sorry, it's in this right there under medications of a botulism toxin. Yeah, and so um, the reason that I didn't mention Botox in this talk is because that's really, it's only going to get insurance approval once somebody has failed um, three or more medications. So in order to get approval for it, you have to have a chronic migraine pattern and you've got to have failed um, a beta blocker, a um, or like an anti-hypertensive, um, an AED, like an anti-epileptic, and an um, antidepressant. And so it's really, it should not really be too much first line management. I think the other thing too is that, especially in the pediatric situation, is that one of the things that I've seen done perhaps incorrectly is you take this kid that's horribly disabled and then you're like, I'm going to give you Botox. Botox actually hurts. Like, um, I don't know, you know, but basically a lot of times people will actually go into a status migraine pattern right after the injection, so it can actually increase your pain briefly. And if I've got a kid who is not functioning, I can make them way worse, like they'll end up in the emergency room or in the hospital. So I actually need to get them to a psychological state where they're able to handle it. The other thing too is that it's very important for all of my patients who are highly disabled and highly refractory for them to understand that um, it's a partnership and functioning is essential. That there's not going to be, it's not like as soon as you get Botox, your life is going to be completely transformed and you're going to be a straight A student. You know, like we've got to be able to gradually work there. So we, but by the way, we, yes, we use Botox a lot. We do a simple nerve blocks a lot. We do a lot of procedural interventions without a doubt. But as far as kind of um, more first line management, you know. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.